we try and do this evening is have a proper conversation um, rather than a platitudinous one about the role of advisors, wealth, philanthropy, um, and trust and values, which is what this is about. Um, I was told that the session is about how to deepen your client relationships by exploring their values and vision for their wealth. Um, and we can have that at all the way, we can have it in a really interesting way and get to some of the thornier issues. Um, as the more people pick up their phones in boredom, I will ask more provocative questions. And if anyone walks out in disgust, we will dial it back a little bit. Um, as it goes. Yes? Phones up. Phones up. Very good, John. You're going to regret that. Um, I, get, I get invited by philanthropy in fact about once a year, and then they uh, remember how I dress and the questions I ask and don't invite me for another year. But uh, thank you for having me this time. Um, see you in 12 months. Um, so, just before we start, just in terms of the audience, um, how many people here work in some sort of advisory role? Um, um, advisors. Okay, so, quarter uh, after the room. Great. Um, um, so, we're going to be talking a lot about the role of advisors. Um, and I think it's quite easy to kind of think of advisors and these unbelievably wealthy people who they work with who are flying past in private jets is a completely different world from our own. But how many people in the room have a pension? Um, and how many people in the room believe that uh, climate change is happening man-made and not good? Right. How many people know for a fact that their pensions are completely divested from fossil fuel intensive industries? Okay, we're down to about a quarter. And how many know not just that their pensions are divested from fossil fuel intensive industries, but their pensions are carbon negative? If you don't know for a fact, I promise you it's not true. Um, so, we are all being failed one way or another in our quest to live our values and our beliefs through our money, through the services that we buy, that we're provided with, through our employer or the advice that we get. Um, and it's no different, I think, for, for wealthy individuals. Um, so, uh, Philanthropy Impact tells us that um, the average rating for philanthropy and social investment advice from higher wealth individuals uh, falls below 6 out of 10 um, for the advice that they're getting. This is from your research, John. I'm right about that? Yeah. I mean, it's fairly miserable. We can, we, we can agree. Um, uh, I don't think anyone's here working for a firm that strives for a 5.8 from, from their clients on, on TripAdvisor. So, um, how do we explain the, the kind of collective misery of advice that people are getting and, and what can we do to improve it? And is it the case, uh, and this is going to be an actual question for our panelists, uh, so <laughs> click you into gear here. Is it the case that we all need to give better advice, or is it the case that um, uh, bankers, lawyers, accountants have no place giving philanthropic advice um, and we wouldn't design a situation where they weren't giving that advice and they should stop and the average will go up? Um, and, um, or is there something that I've missed? Um, Grant, if we don't mind, can we start with you? Um, because you've been on the receiving end of a lot of advice, you've been on a tremendous philanthropic journey. Um, how, how useful were your advisors, and would you have wanted more from more different people, or did you get enough from the right people, or did you just figure it out yourself? Okay. Uh, Everybody hear me? Can you? Hi. So um, I would like to, to maybe kick off by saying um, uh, I'm not sure that I recognize the 5.8. I think that um, uh, I would like to say that um, I have, in my own experience as a philanthropist, thank you. I, hello, that's a lot easier, isn't it? Yes, thank you. So I'm just saying that I don't necessarily agree, in my own opinion, on the Maybe I can share some, some thoughts and ideas around how I've worked um, as a philanthropist, as a funder, um, uh, and, and where the, where's been added value, uh, if I could put it that way, what, what I've found valuable. In, in, um, and it's come in, in a bunch of different ways, and it's not always so much necessarily about purely advice and that sort of, you know, 
go to your accountant, you want some taxation advice, you know, quite clear, you've got a very clear question, but you want to, you know, looking for a, you know, some clear answers, options, and so on. I think with philanthropy, um, some of it falls into that bucket. So uh, when we set up our grant making foundation, um, we had some discussions uh, with the law firm. And maybe the one, one of the most interesting aspects about that was when it came to governance and, and the conversation we could have really about how we want to think about the governance of our, of our future you know, uh, foundation. Um, and that was really, that was, you know, so that was a one, one, one sort of piece where I felt there was a lot of value coming around, um, around advice. But equally, I think a lot of, um, I think, where the advisors, um, or, or where our advisors, or those organizations we work with, maybe more in the management of wealth, for example, I'm thinking of the financial institutions we work with, they are, what, what, what we find is very valuable is they're so good at sort of making connections where they, you know, once they've understood kind of, you know, once we've had discussions, or I've had discussions, had discussions about what you know, what our goals are, our mission, what we're trying to, the change that we're trying to make. Um, where I find uh, the advisors are great, the best ones is that they're really good at actually connecting some dots and, and providing a huge sort of uh, added value. I think around um, their the the power that they have in terms of what you have those of you in the room around your client relationships. Your networks are just infinitely greater than you know, can possibly ever have as a, even as an individual like myself. You know, I can network, but uh, so that's been another another dimension. I would say uh, that I, I found really uh, really really valuable, and and and, and I, I'm I'm quite interested in the concept of cause related networks. You know, when when you've got a focus in your philanthropy around a particular cause, and um, uh, so. There are people here in the room, even uh, um, you know, who I've spoken to and have you know helped really bring knowledge and experience, but also helped to introduce us to other 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 grant makers um, and indeed other families to talk about other families' experience around giving. So that just to kick it off, those are some some positive you know touch points in terms of um, how we've engaged with our advisors around philanthropy in our own experience. Thank you. So. Anthony, yes. What's the bad thing giving philanthropy advice? To the yeah. What's, what's the bad thing giving philanthropy advice? I think this is uh, um, I think from our perspective, we view it as we. Uh, as a piece of research maybe that illustrates the point. From I mean, this is now 2015, so quite a long time ago. But um, I think this was done in the U.S. But the the, the data that came back was, it was asking individuals, you know, how many of you are giving in some capacity, and it was 90 percent of the clients. And then the other question was, how many were satisfied with your giving? And it was 20% of your clients. So there's obviously a gap there between, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of good intention and people are engaged on this topic. Um, and it's more and more becoming a topic that is talked about from philanthropy and charity through to investing, through to operating businesses, through to everything that we do. Um, and so as a, uh, what is a bank doing? I think if a bank looks and says, we want to provide a holistic and an integrated wealth management service, oftentimes the question can come down to, well, what is that wealth actually for? Um, and once, once it gets to a certain level, it's, it's, it's ultimately going to be for some other purpose in, in many instances. And the Bill Gates and the Mark Zuckerberg are the cliche examples, but they're giving most of their money away, or a large portion of their money away. And we've seen that trend um, cascade down um, from those more cliche examples to um, two typical clients that we would engage with who do want uh, to set aside a large portion of their wealth um, for something else which is largely uh, focused on philanthropy. And so um, that's, I think, one of the key reasons um, that we're engaged with. Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of setup and the thinking at you did? Because, you know, every bank I walk into these days says, oh, we do philanthropy now because they've got one person that they've kind of hired and no one knows and no one speaks to. You yeah. have to set up the proper operation. You're actually yeah. programs, finding programs. Yeah. You've got a whole team in place. That's, yeah. that's not the norm. And yeah. what, what do you think? What's the benefit of doing it that way? I, I suppose the benefit.
benefit is that it's is that it's in house. I think to get to that point, you need to have buy-in from the top. I mean, uh, otherwise it just doesn't happen because there's a cost associated with implementing it. Um, there is a global team of 60 people that work in philanthropy at UBS. I'm not an expert. I think any of these 60 people would say no one's an expert. I've been at UBS 12 years. I joined the philanthropy side five years ago, so I've learned everything on the job. So I think I think there is a place for people who aren't. Uh, who don't have you know, 20 years of experience to engage in this, um, but we do have a team which collectively can, can come together and offer different expertises and experiences um, to clients. The way it's structured at UBS is really doing everything from providing the advice, so you know, what does good look like, strategy, structuring, um, through to what we would say the more difficult parts are, once you know what you care about, once you have your legal vehicle, how do you deploy the capital and not cause harm and maximize your social impact? Because none of us, including Bill and, and Mark Zuckerberg, have enough money to solve all these problems. So we need to collaborate. None of us are experts. We need to engage with parties like governments who do have capital. Um, and that's really what we um, try to do, is help individuals maximize their impact with the limited financial resources um, that we all have. Thank you. So, Joe, in, in terms of law firms, accountancies, should you play a more active role, get into strategy, get into values, or should you structure and get out of the way and let people do what they're doing? What's your view on it? So I think it's, I think it's really interesting, Mark, because, um, yeah, I do think it's really interesting, Mark, because obviously KPMG is an accountancy firm. We've been involved in a charity for a long time. You know, KPMG has been around 100 Year. And so for us, this is something we've done. We audit charities. We've always helped with kind of tax around that. Um, and whether we should move into a more advisory space is, is something that we are on our voyage of discovering at the moment. You know, our view is very much around community, kind of picking up on, on your point is actually our focus is to, to stick what we're good at, we're very good at tax, we're good at accountancy, but actually there are others that are better at other things. So it's about creating community. So community of other advisors that we know have strengths in particular areas. We don't do investment advisory as an example. We're not an evil firm. Um, but also the community of clients. So that's the thing that our clients like is that community sense. And I think through that we have conversations. But to be honest, I'm, I'm an inheritance science specialist. And one of the key things you talk to people about is what's your legacy when you die? And you know, that's, not a, that's not specifically about philanthropy then it brings on that conversation and then that kind of helps really with what we're doing. So in the private client tax world, we've been doing this kind of thing all the time around purpose and how you want your impact to be, but I suppose now it's just got a slightly different name. So I would say we've always been doing it, but maybe it's just got a slightly different focus now. And in terms of straying into strategy as opposed to structuring, do you do it? Do you think that people should do it? Um, how do you compare it to your competitors? How do you think about it? So I think we do a lot of family governance work. So we've got to work with families a lot. And obviously philanthropy is a key strand in family governance often. Um, and so purpose of wealth, you know, as you were saying, is, is a key component of family governance and you know, all people's purposes. And so we do definitely talk about that. But I would say we don't do it alone. So we do it collaboratively. We're a very collaborative firm. So you know, if there's a law firm or another firm that you know, they would use. And you know, where, for example, a family decides to say, oh, we, we want to do a particular Again, we would kind of use our community to kind of help them do that. So we were lucky with a global firm. We're pretty much we're in ridiculous amount of countries. So we've got a great global reach. But at the same point, you know, as you were saying, we've got a great global reach of clients too. Um, so I, I think there is a space for doing it, but I don't think you should be selfish and feel like you can only do it on your own. I think it's okay to do it in a collaborative sense. Um, so I was going to say one thing that I kind of important to say was. There's a, as as, as, as um, everyone touched on, there's different types of advice from sort of the tax structure and through to what do you actually give to. And, and you know, the reason the way we're set up that we're able to talk about the latter is how you actually deploy the capital is not because they employ people like me, but it's because they've actually in house experts from the development sector who have years of experience and expertise who actually can say, this is a good build up investment. We've done deep due diligence on this and we think you should put your money here. It's, it's a very similar analogy to a financial investment. A bank is going to hire people who are experts in finance to build those investments and then ultimately recommend those investments. And you pretty much need to do the same to offer philanthropic investments, or you need to find a partner externally who has an expertise in it. Please. So, just um, building a bit on 
Joe's point, uh, uh, the work everybody does as advisors, I'd just like to come back to the softer issues. Because I think there is a real role for, for advisors in this whole question of soft issues of families. So, um, you know, so we, you often talk about family governance, you know, sort of all the issues around that. But if you take that into philanthropy and families, and, and I'm talking from our experience uh, in, in, in our wider family, uh, I'm a member of a business family, when, when it came to setting up our foundation, uh, which is about six years ago, we you know, there were some very divergent views in the family about what that should be about, you know, how, how, what it should look like, you know, um, uh, all kinds of questions around mission and so on. And, uh, and I think it was really, it was so, so important that we, we found a way to break through that. And, and, and that whole process, we worked with, uh, we worked um, on those sort of softer issues with, uh, with an advisor. It was, uh, you know, we, we, cause we, we had some, you know, we had, we had some challenging each other across the table. But I think we got to a good place in the end, and uh, uh, so, so yeah, um, you know, even uh, the hardest stuff, yes, but on the softer stuff too, the, the, the big roles that front advisors can play and do play. Can I, can I ask, because you mentioned hiring in people from the development sector, um, you know, if you speak to a lot of people from the charity sector, they're worried about the trend. Right. You know, they already feel that philanthropists are disconnected from them, that the staff they hire are from a privileged minority, they don't represent communities they serve, they don't have that expertise, and now people are going to be moving even further away and getting their advice from banks who are seen as maximizing profits at the expense of workers' salaries and accountancies that are um, taking tax dollars out of the government purse. Now, whether that's fair or not, you guys can come back on, but that is the impression from the charity sector and I think there's an issue here with, with trust not just from the clients that you serve but the people in the charity sector who are meant to be the ultimate beneficiaries of, of this activity and those people who your clients wish to serve. And what's the case um, that uh, professional advisors, trusted advisors should be acting in this kind of structuring intermediary role as opposed to leaving that to community groups? I suppose it's not that our community group should take a step back, but I, I guess we take a view that solving problems is hard, um, and it requires collaboration and mutual and, and different stakeholders to engage in that. If the status quo was working, there wouldn't be a need for advice um, or other people to engage. I think philanthropists themselves are looking to see more and more, what is the actual return on my dollar? Um, you know, if I'm going to give X, I want to solve this problem. It might take me 20 years, but I don't want this problem to exist in 25 years because then what was the point, right? And so it's taking that mindset, and we kind of distill it down to as nat naturally we would. It's an investment-based approach. It's a business entrepreneurial approach. Um, I, I, if you were born after 1990, Bill Gates is more known for his foundation and Melinda's foundation than Microsoft, right? And so he's, it's, it's his life, right? And that's really what it requires, um, to an extreme example, to solve global issues. So, so I guess what, what I'm hearing is that you're actually bringing some of the specializations from the bank and the banking sector into the social sector for those people who are more inclined to have an effective altruism, impact metrics driven approach to philanthropy as a kind of theory of change. Is that is that fair? Like, I think that's that's fair. I suppose it's. I mean, from a from a, from a from a bank perspective, why I offer this is because we we know it's something that is important. It's becoming increasingly important. And if you want to, if your if your main client base is extremely interested in the subject matter and you can't engage on that, then you're not a leading institution. Would be the simple view. And, and Grant, have you ever had? Would you ever have or advise others if you're talking to peers, you know, to say, you know, is, is your first point of call going to be um, professional advisory services when you're thinking about the social change you want to create in the world, or is there a risk that they will have a conservative influence or don't sit alongside what you're trying to achieve? What, what would you advise peers? Um, well, may, maybe allow me to take in a slightly different direction and just. Uh, 
but to, to, to get into that into that question about the role of advisors from a different angle, and that's the angle of, I think one of the big uh, challenges that we, we all face out there is in a world that we have today with, uh, I think, um, the new generation, let's speak about millennials, your generation, I think, <laughs> I think there is a, there's a big question mark around um, how do they really see philanthropy do they, do they see it in a positive way? Uh, how do they view wealth uh, more broadly? Do they, uh, do they accept that we, do they see that we're responsible, we, uh, the wider we, we're responsible, responsible stewards of that wealth? And very often, as we know, the answer is no. And you've only got to, you know, to look at you know, some of the discussions around the World Economic Forum, I know it was last year, around you know, the, uh, the question about tax, you know, is tax paid? Uh, then there's the question of climate change, you know, and, and that whole issue too. So I think that um, as we try to engage with the next generation, and, and they have a, I think they have much more of a spectrum view, that, uh, you know, philanthropy is fine as long as it comes with a responsible approach to your entire wealth. And I think that's sort of what Anthony's driving at here, um, and I see that. Even, you know, I see that in my own kids, so I've got you know, kids in their 30s and the sort of discussions we have. So I think you know, it's vitally important for advisors, you know, uh, you know, in terms of where all you guys sit on that, in terms of you know, knowing where, you know, helping us and working together with families who are going through these challenges, because as all this, you know, you've read the numbers in terms of the trillions that are going to end, you know, that we're, will be passed over in the course of the next sort of decade or two into the hands of the next generation and they're going to be asking a bunch of really difficult questions. I get the questions, but you know, so, um, uh, and I uh, try and answer them, but, um, but I think, you know, that's where we're all sort of, I think the advisors are just, you guys, how you approach those issues too is going to be very important and, uh, you know, being able to, to sort of have the right debates and, 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 you know, get on that journey as well. I know, you know, I know your organizations are, and you talk about all these things, but, you know, we're, we're being challenged, I think. So, how are we going to respond to that? That's the question. Jared, do you have any thoughts on what the response should be? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think with all these things, a response, a response is, a, is a challenge, isn't it? Because I think you're right. I mean, where, where I think the charity sector, I mean, they have issues of trust, too. And, you know, I think, actually, lots of our clients don't necessarily have a bit of a trust issue with some charities. Not, not naming particular ones, but just so I think it is a bit of a broken. I, I think if we're benchmarking charity sector trust levels are higher than. Well, I think it depends on what. I think it depends on what. I think it depends in what context you're doing it. But I mean, I would, I would say that the, the whole thing needs reform because actually, I agree with Anthony that you know more, more heads together is better than none. And so actually we all trying to do the same thing, just me trying to approach it in a slightly different way. I think the clients are asking me to, for advice on things that aren't strictly charitable. So it'd be things that are maybe social good, where they don't fall within the charity regime and therefore the rules on how it works are less clear cut. And therefore actually we are doing something a bit different and we are having to be innovative about how we do it in such a way that we're maximising the impact. But also minimising the downside risk for that individual so if I have a client, for example, that has a lending business that lends money out to clients um, because he thinks it's the right thing to do. And is, is it lending? Well, he doesn't really want the money back, but actually if they make a massive success, he does. So what is that? Is that business? Is that charity? Um, it's just kind of a not-for-profit-y type thing. One of the businesses has done really well, so he's made loads of money out of it, but all the rest haven't. So for me, it's the complexity of what, what clients are trying to do it means that you need to have lots of advisors to help you solve that problem. Back to Andy saying, it's not, well, it's obvious to do this. Actually, it's very case by case, it's very bespoke, and I think it does need you know, all the best people to put their minds to it and come up with the best answer. And, and can I ask a, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a nice question after this one. So. <laughs> but, but building on Grant's point about uh, the next generation coming through, you know, the, the biggest crime uh, uh, that anyone can commit these days is hypocrisy on social media, right? It, it, it's a death nail to a teenager or someone in their 20s or 30s to be exposed in this way. Um, and, and I think, speaking to a lot of the next gen world, they feel exposed um, because the reality is that their values are they want to be good citizens, they're scared about climate change, they want to give philanthropic 
basically in Beyond's partners to the communities, but their money is offshore, tax minimized, profit maximized, sometimes ESG screened a bit, um, and they feel really uncomfortable with it, and doing a bit of philanthropy and charity uh, doesn't make up for it, right? Um, and then you meet all these people in the, in the advisory sector who are really trying to do the best with their clients, and really, you know, the work you guys are doing is amazing, and one of your colleagues the other day who was, who was referred to my client of mine said they were doing great work um, at KPMG, um, and whether you feel that there are tensions within the industry now about the kind of cumulative effect of the whole industry on, on the bulk of the money, as opposed to the positive effect of those people within it who are driving a lot change around the philanthropy. Um, and is there, is there a challenge there that the industry needs to face up to? I mean, I, I think that your comments around offshore tax minimised, profit maximised, are uh, outdated. I mean, I would say that most of my clients where I work with and community work with, yeah, that's, that's quite a, that's not really the type of tax advice that it doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, the industry has massively changed, how people look after their wealth has massively changed. So I think that's, it's kind of a, so I'd say most clients are coming to the fact that they don't want this kind of, this tension, and they want to either be, right, okay, I want to be a good citizen, and I mean that, I look at the B Corporation rules and I apply that across every sphere of my life, and that's my business and my personal life and everything, and to me that's where clients are moving, and that is, you know, that is, that fits with capability values and what we do, so I would say that there is a real move for being, you know, completely and utterly true all the way through. So I, I agree that there'll still be bits of the industry where that won't work, but I, I reckon give it five years and it will be a completely different world. I think tax planning has massively changed. I mean, I've been doing it 20 years, and it's very different in that time. I think the speed of change is massively, you know, very quick. And so I think well for a couple of years, and actually the world will be very different. I think, just to be clear, being offshore is not bad. Right? It doesn't mean that bad is offshore. But, um, you know, actually, there, there are very... But, but there is, it's interesting because there's also the world that people live in, and if everyone else says it's bad, then it's going to be a bad experience for you as a millennial coming into offshore wealth, even if it wasn't structured as a tax evasion scheme in the first instance. And so there's the kind of softer side of it, which is the emotional appreciation of it. Um, but it's great to hear that you think that the whole sector is, is, is evolving, because I speak to a lot of my clients and they feel even if we're not talking about offshore and complex structures, you know, they're in a battle where they want to do their fair bit to be a good citizen, and they can only buy services which are uh, supporting them to do as little as possible or make them as much as possible. So it's great to hear that you're seeing the industry evolve and you think it will transform. Fantastic. I was just going to add maybe, um, and I'm not on the investment side of UBS, but we more and more are having the conversation around, uh, especially as impacts sustainable investments become more uh, common. Uh, I've been having more conversations with clients around what is your, you know, the phrase is net impact, right? So maybe if you kind of touched on you know, what if you're, you might be saving lives and you have measurable causal data and evidence telling you that with your grant making. Um, with your one million of grant making a year, but if your 300 million is invested in companies which are trafficking children, then what is your net impact, right? And, and these things are really hard to measure. Um, uh, you know, both with both measuring the impact of an operating company, measuring the impact of your investments, um, but it is something which we are trying to more and more highlight and talk about. In that, it is not in necessarily an either or one's better than the other. Uh, but how can your entire asset base further your social or environmental mission? Um, and it's not to say we there are, there are all the answers or it's very easy to do, but it's something to think about. I think more. I, I, you know, I think uh, if I could say, um, taking uh, Joe's point here and, uh, and what Anthony is saying, that I, I think as users, if you like, of client service, as, as a user of client services, we recognize that also the, your organizations, you're on a journey too. We're all on a journey. And, and we're no, none of us are perfect. And so we're moving in there. We're going through this transition, this period you talked about, another five years or whatever, but we're on that journey. So I think one of the things we said, and we have principles, we have our own written principles, we want to work with organizations that are serious about the change. So, you know, what does that mean? You know, it's more of a feel, you know, it's something, uh, you know, you, you don't, it's not a hard number, but it is something that we look at 
in terms of you know who we'd like to work with and who we do work with. So, yeah. and, and do you feel clients trying to influence you now on whether that be ethical practice or investment practice and things? Are you getting are you getting stretched by your clients in a positive way? I'd say yes. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I mean, for us, because I suppose we are more of a, so for example, through the audit process, actually what the strength of kind of audit committees is they can demand something. So they can say that in your audit team you have to have X number of women, or you have to agree that your carbon impact will be X. So, you know, large corporates are to some extent driving change in professional services too, because you know, they're, they're pushing that agenda and making us make changes, which I think we would do anyway if it's smoothing. Um, I have no idea what time it is or how long we have left. John, do we have time for a couple of questions from the audience? We have, uh, no? 40 minutes. 40 minutes. We've got time for lots of questions from the audience. Perfect. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what do you think the effect... Oh, sorry. What, um, I'm Ida Levine and I'm here for the impact investing. Ah. It, it was just coming on. You guys. And I'm here for the Impact Investing Institute. I'm the director there. What do you think the effect of Mythic 2 will be? Um, I've, I've seen a draft of the regulations that are coming out, and advisors will have to ask their clients about their Can you explain a bit about Mythic 2 for everyone? So, so Mythic 2 change. covers a lot of different things, but this particular part will require advisors to ask their clients what their ESG preferences are in determining the suitability of investments for their clients. Um, and that will be coming in, I, I think we'll see a draft in the second quarter of this year. So when you're doing your risk questionnaire, you're also going to be yes. talking about your values and ESG. That's exactly it. Um, I personally think it's going to have a huge effect. Because as we saw from all the hands up, uh, I think a lot of people do really want to see investments that are sustainable and have a positive effect on people and planet. And um, when the advisors ask the question and the clients say, I'd like to have a sustainable portfolio, they're going to have to have product. Yeah, I'm going to talk about what sustainable means. Um, uh, any views on method two and the, the impact it will have? Do you think it will um, push you for the better? I'm personally not close to method two, although I hear people on the floor talking about it a lot. And, uh, it's definitely a lot of work, I think, for the whole industry. But I, I agree, I think um, it will be positive. I know, even as of honestly, as of today, uh, there's a, you know, there's a, as you mentioned, there's been multiple streams of, of method two that have been going on for quite some time. But as of today, there was a working group at UBS to start to look at the sustainability components of that. Um, so it is something which is going to be looked at. It, I can think it's only a positive that that all client advisors will have to ask these questions and have a have a comfortable level of understanding and have ability to talk about these types of topics. Um, and as you said, it will naturally lead to more products being built, more investment opportunities. That comes on to the the point Jay Davis went to is, you know, what does impact mean or what does sustainability mean? Um, at worst, it's marketing. At best, it's going to be you know real causal, measurable in, in, impact, right? And so I think the market will grow and that definition will mature and there'll be more opportunities that come about. Um, five, 10, 20 years from now, it'll be a completely different landscape, but I think it's trending in the positive direction. Yeah. Do you think that um, advisors uh, have the tools to talk to their clients about about ES, about like sustainability and, and and these sorts of um, values. About well, values potentially. I mean, that values is a relationship, personal conversation. So yes, I think most relationship manager, managers, that's they're quite probably good at having those conversations. Or if they're not good themselves, they know who to bring along to have that conversation with their client. In regards to talking specifically about impact, sustainable, or ESG investing, whatever you want to call it. Today, no, I would say most client advisors probably would say, out of my comfort zone, therefore I'm not going to talk about it. Which then is just a chicken and egg situation where it doesn't grow, right? It's the same with philanthropy. When we started six years ago in the UK, client advisors had no idea how to talk about it. Whereas now, after six years of constant, consistent communication and education, there's a probably you know, a very high percentage that feel very comfortable talking about it and they bring it up and the offering grows, right? And so I just ask on that point, when they're talking about it, do they say speak to Anthony or do they really talk about it? They 
they talk about it to the extent that they can, some of them can talk about it and they don't even really need to involve us unless there's something specific um, or if it's a, a bigger project. Um, most, I would say, are comfortable enough talking about it, explaining what we do, how we do, why we do it, um, and, and can talk enough to get a meeting or a call with someone who can go into detail. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, it do to me sounds like a you know, a great opportunity. Obviously, the way you're looking for kind of real change regulation is probably one of the good ways of doing it because it kind of forces action rather than I know you know actually you can see what clients want, so you should be changing your services and products to meet client demands. But actually, it's always hard, isn't it? Um, whereas when it kind of required to, then I think it does kind of push the dial. So to me, it, it feels like a positive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to, um, well, I can't answer from the advisor side, but from more from the client side, I can say that uh, I think there's more conversations going on, um, speaking maybe a bit from personal experience around um, talking in our family about purpose of wealth, talking about related to that, what our values are, and uh, you know what in our investment beliefs would be. And I think you know I'm, I'm sure many families are sort of discussing these issues so that. Uh, so that, uh, and I think, you know, and it becomes pretty clear in the conversations with your advisors, you know, who gets it and who doesn't. Back to my point about, you know, we're, we're, we're all on this change together. So, but we, you know, I, I think, um, again, that's maybe another opportunity, you know, I think, you know, thinking about, you know, families, encouraging more families to, to get onto that journey about discussing with the next generation, having the conversation with the next generation about those issues, because out of those conversations can, can come can come good, not, not, I'm not talking about, you know, in terms of investment return or even of impact, I'm talking about actually family, about alignment around, you know, what you actually believe in and, uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if, 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 you're, if your family unit's important to you, then I think there's, uh, you know, I think those conversations can be very powerful in, uh, in, in sort of in, in creating unity or, or a sense of shared purpose at least. Well, can, I, can I ask you about that? Because, you know, legislation or regulation. He knows one of my daughters, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, regulation and legislation as a, as a means to promote conversations about values. Do you think that this particular, if the two things going to you know, be, be a tick box exercise on, on part of the advisors, and those that have the values and align and want to do it well will do it, and those that don't, we'll, we'll, we'll skip it, or do you think it could transform the industry? I understand that, I understand that all these things are required, uh, and I think legislation is important, particularly not just for private wealth management, for the broader institutional man management of funds, because it's, you know, given that, you know, we're all, most of us are, you know, we're, we have our pensions too, so I think, uh, I think the regulation is important as well. Great, thank you. I mean, it's, I think it's a fascinating point on, on what it's going to mean. Um, and when I say I care about the planet and the E or the S or indeed the G, um, what, what does that actually mean? Uh, I was looking at a, uh, an ESG fund the other day that had passed through 497 out of 500 stocks, um, including Exxon. You just think, what are we doing here? Right? And so uh, I think that the, there will be in the detail of the implementation side of things, should we? I think the EU is working on the definition, so yeah. there won't be greenwashing. Yeah, very good. Um, perfect. Yes, we can, we can take to it and pass the front. So it's actually a question for you. So a lot of the time in the charity sector, we often look at sort of private advisors in terms of the knowledge basis that they have. What often you find when it comes to more mature types of it's actually not that knowledge in the sector itself. So I was very lucky. My upbringing was East End Community Foundation, so I learned about donor advice funds and all that type of stuff. And then moved to Unlimited, which was social investment, social enterprise, very mature types of giving. What often you find when you speak to your colleagues, when you mention these vehicles, when you mention these types of ways that you can give, knowledge isn't there. So to then say to professional advisors that expectancy for them to have it is slightly paradoxical, particularly if they're then coming to us to ask for that knowledge. So do you, do you think there needs to be more knowledge share, sharing within the charity sector itself in the first instance? So then when we do speak to professional advisors, it's not the generic answer of, yeah, 
give some money there or set up a foundation. And to, the second question is to sort of the corporate organisations. How are you dealing with the paradox of being able to attract clients? Because ultimately it's easy to say, yes, give your fund to an ESG aspect or a social investment or something along that line. But if corporately a lot of your investments are going to, it doesn't even need to be offshore, but it could be something that's actually damaging to the planet. So you look at an organisation like Barclays where a lot of their money in terms of loans is still going out to organisations that are actually causing climate change. And then to say to, and if, to set up a philanthropy team to say, yeah, we, get, we make sure our clients invest in businesses that, that, that go against that. There's a, there's a massive paradox there, and I think when it comes to attracting the next generation, there's a slight issue because you can all give 2% uplift, but now this next generation, even below the millennials, they're really looking across to see what's the difference between okay, PMG, what's the difference between UBS, what's the difference between Rothschild, and ultimately they'll look at your brand. So how are you guys dealing with that paradox? Question, sorry. I was asking a difficult question. <laughs> 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 no, we can start with these. Um, do you guys want some time to think I can start with, with Marlon, or do you want to advise Craig? I'm going to start the exact questions. I'm going to make an answer the exact question. I'll start with a different question. I'm going to think around them. I suppose I was just thinking that all of, it's important to provide the right advice, right? So I think it depends. I mean, you, the, the example would be. Um, a real example, the other uh, few weeks ago, we met an individual who had substantial wealth who wanted to save uh, X number of million of lives. Um, so a huge ambition, had, had lots uh, of money that was planned to be given away. Um, and they wanted to invest in a certain model that was done in one country and bring it to another continent. Um, and they wanted help in doing that. Uh, they wanted uh, to engage with us. We would co-fund alongside them provide strategic consulting services around it. Um, and the advice that we gave the individual uh, was not to say, yes, we can help you. We can, we can roll out this model over here. Because we actually looked at it, and we, the model that they were invested in, or wanted to invest in, had no data that it was good, that it was working. Um, and, and beyond that, uh, their main objective was to save X million of lives in their lifetime. And we just looked at different estimates of what's the cost to save a life from 600 to 9,000 a dollar to save a life area and estimates. And we went back and we just said, it's going to cost you 900 million to 6 billion to save X number of lives. You've told us you want to give away 100 million. So there's no way doing what you want to do, you can achieve your objective. Um, and I guess it's just an example to say that not all advice uh, is going to be, not the best advice is not necessarily advice that one wants to hear. Um, and so I think it's important that firms do not just do what is, you should do what's best for the client, but you should also guide that client on a journey towards what you think is most impactful, right? So not, not just do something because the client wants to do something, so therefore it's good for business, so we should engage with this person regardless, but actually have a view as to what is right and what is good, and provide, that is the best advice you can provide to an individual. Actually, the plan that you have is not going to achieve your goal. So therefore, we suggest you do something else. I don't know if that answers. I'm going to finish this one. Do you want to come in? I think uh, you have two questions. One's about kind of knowledge sharing. And I think it's, I think it's really important to share knowledge in this area because, you know, actually, there's always new things that are coming out, or there's new knowledge. And, you know, so, so we try very hard to share knowledge. You know, we, at SBCC, it's a game we use charity that we partner with. We've raised a million pounds our staff around this year. But we've done a whole training on how gift aid works, how tax reliefs work, so that when they are doing their fundraising, they're doing it from a, a base of tax knowledge, and that's because we're good at tax, right? But then in return, they gave us some really great insights into what, what their challenges are and how they want to work. So I think in this space, it's great where you can kind of, um, we can kind of share knowledge. I think your second question around how does large corporates like ourselves kind of deal with that, that kind of tension, I suppose. And to me, I distinguish it between two things. There's, there's, a, the service, there's a services that we do ourselves, right? And so we are very conscious about how we go about that. We are living wage employer. We are very conscious of our carbon footprint. We, we've done a lot of steps about how we go about our business. But then there's a separate bit around the types of clients that we work with and the businesses that they do. And so I think we're on a journey about how we do that and how we do that in a way that is consistent with our values that are very important to us. And I think. 
you're right that where where a large corporate gets that right and kind of aligns the values means that they will be more attractive as a brand. But I think there's no one out there that's got it 100 percent right. I think most people are kind of working on that. Can I just be a little bit careful because I feel like being conscious about your carbon footprint is, yeah. is great, but not KPMG specifically, but the big four accounting firms, uh, your actions and the, the core service you to provide to your clients will have a market impact on how much money there is to pay for the schools and hospitals and nurses, and in the same way, UBS's investments, the weight of capital you have behind you, either drive climate change or drive us away from it, right? And either increase in inequality or distribute wealth. Um, and and how do, how do those, those big conversations happen in the space where you're also trying to service a client in front of you? And maybe I can ask this to Grant. Would, would you rather find an advisory firm that gave you excellent philanthropic advice but was giving someone else advice that took money out of the exchequer and pushed for, for <coughs> finance fossil fuels, or would you find rather find one that had less philanthropy advice but wasn't doing either of those things in the first place? Ultimately it's not about the philanthropy advice, it's about the bigger picture. I think it's really about it's back to maybe my point earlier on is about have a clear idea, if you have a clear idea of the purpose of your wealth, your values I think you're looking at the bigger picture, you know, I mean, uh, philanthropy is important, but it's, a, it's about that wider, it's about that wider discussion about what your entire wealth is having in terms of impact. I think that's, that's where we're moving in that direction. We're not there yet totally, but I think that's the way it's heading. And then, and then to the point you made earlier, and, you know, you spoke about what I said was almost offsetting, you know, your net impact is yeah. the harm you're doing, by the good you're doing, whatever it is, whereas maybe we're moving to a place where doing any harm isn't acceptable, <laughs> and so it's just the amount of good you can do on top, and, and what is it that's going to accelerate that journey? Is it, is it your customers? Is it leadership within organisations? I'm not talking about your organisation specifically, but across the side. I think it's a combination. It's, it's, it's clients, it's next gen, it's millennials, it's, it's, it's definitely coming from clients, it's coming from Leadership. I mean, we recently held an event with Paul Pullman, who was very big on engaging CEOs and corporates on on, on how to um, engage in this type of way. Um, so it needs to come from you know to make big change in these big organizations. You really need to have buy-in from the top. Otherwise, it just doesn't get the legs and the traction and the investment. So that is very critical. Um, and uh, I think also the regulation that was mentioned. I mean. Sometimes it might seem like a tick in the box exercise, but it's certainly a better world if every client advisor needs to once a year ask every single client and record it that do you have, do you, what are your vision, what are your values, how do you want to invest sustainably, socially, etc. Then not doing it, you know, and so that will drive um, activity um, in that system. And I also think, you know, to give these guys a break, you know, we. We get the advice we deserve, right? And if we're all lazy about our pensions, then they're going to go to the easiest, laziest investments, which will be tracker funds, which will be disproportionately um, heavy on fossil fuels. And, and is that on, on our pension funds or is that on us because we haven't stood up and we haven't uh, said that we don't want to do that and we haven't excluded it and we haven't worked hard enough? Because I get the sense that, that, that there isn't an inherent resistance. And if your clients come in tomorrow and say, we want the bank going more in this direction or whichever, whichever firm it is, then, then you'll follow the market, right? Yeah, I mean, an example, not on the investment side, but even environment. I mean, the, the UBS Optimist Foundation, historically for 20 years, has focused on health, education, and child protection issues. And it's going to continue to do that. But as of this last year, due to client demand, it has hired an environmental program director and cemented its charitable objects. It's now going to build out space to engage with clients on that front in addition to the social issues. And so that, you know, that, that would have taken longer potentially if there wasn't you know, clients saying, I really want help on this and you can't help me do it. Why not? And, and I just want to close on, on, on your first question as well. With, uh, and it feels like there's some work for us all to do about the kind of, uh, I 
I think quite a dysfunctional relationship between advisors and, and I can't myself get this as a philanthropy advisor in the charity sector because there's so many charities and so many great people doing amazing work and we tend to be very small teams, we don't have the capacity to engage with everyone um, and we run the risk that certain people, certain organisations, organisations based in London are much more likely to get uh, access to, to clients and, and it feels like this is one of those issues that we've all got to work on together so that we're tapping into the kind of expertise you were talking about, about people who really um, have, have trained in what they're doing and deeply knowledgeable about it that isn't even prevalent across the charity sector or the growing of the sector and, and also bringing that into the advisory space and, and I'm not sure that there's, there's just some work for us all to do to figure that out. Let's take a couple more questions if we can. Um, uh, I'll cross you at the front here and then we'll come around to, to everyone. Uh, so, this is not really changing. It's, so, how, how do you see uh, the role of the professional advice? Because we Can you turn on the mic? It's on. It's it's speaking speaking a bit on. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so, I was just wondering um, if you could have your view in terms of what the role of the professional advisor should be. Because we almost heard uh, of financial advisors this
family spoofed to kind of help them on that journey. It's quite structured, to be fair, it can be kind of adjusted, but the main thrust of it really is about listening to each person individually and then reporting back to kind of the collective results. So you're not kind of saying, oh, this person or that person, but kind of saying, look, as a group, kind of going with themes, trying to depersonalise it a little bit. Um, and because, you know, point of view is always, as a family, it's great if you can do something together, and not every family can, um, but if they can, and we try to work with them to do something collectively, and whether they use a model where, you know, they, they decide on a proportionate approach, you know, do they do a proportion to one cause, or whether they do a, we just split it out, you know, there's loads of different approaches, and where I think <coughs> clients get value from us is we give them, well, this is what other families have done, you know, this is how they've approached it, they've had this tricky issue, and this is what they decided to do. So, so all we're doing is giving them options, sharing your experiences and kind of hoping and guiding them to sort of do their own, find their own way. I would just echo what both of them said. I don't think it's so, or I don't view ever as our role to force a certain way of working together, right? There's been obviously all sorts of examples of families that are disparate that come together and very success story, others that have already decided, no, we're going to do it this way, so then you help them do that. Um, I guess the, you know, the, nap, the role of the advisor is to provide that experience, that advice, to listen, um, to then guide along the best way, best way you can. So you know, there's numerous examples of different ways of working, and I don't think there's ever any one golden formula. Um, okay, so uh, they are chilling the champagne and solving the peanuts. We have 15 minutes left. Um, I'm going to take uh, a few questions at once, so I'm going to make sure we get them. Uh, it will take you to be first. So did you have one at the back as well? Great. We'll take all three and then we'll, we'll ask them together. Hello. So my um, question or comment really, I suppose, is the spectrum from philanthropy through to shareholder voting, through to impact investing, through to well, ESG impact and then ethical investing. My concern is I hear that people talking about it as if it's one thing and it's so broad. And I know that when you mentioned, Jake, about um, ESG, where a lot of companies are still held as stocks. Well, ESG, the funds themselves can be so different. So I think my message, I suppose, is to make sure that the client really understands the spectrum. We're not talking about one thing. We're talking about so broad. And also, excluding stocks isn't always a way to influence. And actually, shareholder voting, you can actually invest in, say, an oil company and have big influence as an investor. And, but also, um, MIFID 2, it, is it going to be just a tick box? I mean, I think it's really important that the fund manager, wealth manager, etc., really understands how different the fund opportunities are. And even two funds that can be marketed the same can be so different with the stocks they're held. Governance and um, transparency and reporting is really key. Um, I went to an event recently and I heard a wealth manager talk about ESG saying, oh well, everybody knows you just lose money. Well, that is actually inaccurate. There's a lot of research shows that impact ethical investing, ESG, you can make good returns and sometimes outperform the market or benchmark. So it's just, it's not really a question, it's just a comment. It's just, I think it's really important this message gets out to wealth managers not to be maybe a conscious, unconscious bias and really check that. You know, don't just say that it's you will lose money because that is inaccurate. It could be inaccurate, it could be accurate. It depends on the fund and holdings, etc. It's not really uh, a question, just to comment. That's okay. That's great. And there's a couple of things I want to pick up on from it. So. Hi, I'm David Pollock from Considered Capital. A question for Anthony. You referred to that 2015 report and the only 20% mm. satisfaction level. Yeah. What were the main reasons? And what, for example, has UBS done to respond to that since? Great. I'm going to take a question at the back as well. Hi there. Um, so actually, I'm coming from the charity side, but I have a history of actually working as a financial advisor and a wealth advisor for 20 odd years um, when it came to the situation. Um, what I'm interested in, based on the fact that the slight conflict of interest that some financial institutions are finding themselves in when they're managing money for charities is. When I go and visit them and I talk to them about us and, and whether they could get their financial advisors and their, and their bankers uh, talking about us, is the, uh, the issue, the fact that, well, if we do that for you and we've got, we're managing assets for, for charities in some time, sometimes 
in significant amounts where they're earning income from, will we not get the pressure from that charity that we need to be recommending them to our clients as well? I um, mean, this isn't aimed at, at, at Anthony at all because um, you know, he's, the UBS is actually one of our, uh, our funders. Um, but, and that's a, an approach that's different, but it's a situation where I'm finding consistently that there is that conflict of interest occurring all the time. And the way that it has to come from, effectively from the actual financial advisors at the bottom of the bankers to move up to their bosses and say, we would like to give financial advice, or, or, or philanthropy advice, sorry, to our clients. And then we'd also like the ability to give them the right, direct them in the right way, in the right way that they want to go. So whatever cause the and interest the actual client has, we would like to be able to turn around and give them four or five examples of what we know are good opportunities for them. As if uh, exactly the same way as you would give your normal financial advice. But we're finding consistently that it's coming from the top down. Thank, Thank you. That's, that's, that's a great question. question. Um, Add an air to it as well. We're going to take one more back corner and then we'll, we'll answer this round. I can project quite well through your microphone. Um, hi, Juliet Valdin. This is really a really question for Joe and Anthony. Um, and slightly touched on the work I know Grant knows with the Beacon Collaborative or Flat Bee Collaborative. I, I challenge the wealth management industry to, they are recognising it's happened. It's taken a few years for you guys to get going. And I know the whole debate a few years ago is who's going to ask first, the client's going to ask the advisors or the advisors going to ask the clients. And it's becoming more and more obvious as the change is happening. I'm wondering though the extent to which the industry, KPMG and UBS, who are leading players in the field, I don't argue that, are going to work together and lead the way, rather than being very good at what you do, an exemplary service, particularly UBS, are sort of leagues above in what you offer. But how much you think the industry will welcome working together to make the change happen. All people are going to really stick in their silos, make my business work, I don't really care what everybody else is doing, but really making a unity of the asset management world who can really make the difference.
comes to the gentleman at that point um, earlier um, about technical expertise, and I think we would run the risk of uh, being under the misapprehension that it's easy to change the world, and particularly amongst wealthy people in circles, the narratives that they can easily fix poor people with a donation here and a, um, an intervention there, and, and the reality is that. that how the world works, and that's not how human beings work, and it's hugely difficult and hugely complex, and it takes great humility to do it well, um, and I think the, the, the challenge that we have is changing this narrative, uh, because what you have to do is expert, right? And what the charities do is expert, um, and it's not the kind of thing you can look up and throw a check at, and I imagine, Grant, you've been on that journey in, in, in the Charter Trust and, and the kind of work you're doing, haven't you? Um, I mean, it this is maybe uh, this is more a point for around uh, philanthropy, uh, especially major donor giving and charities. I think I think where a lot of the there is a lot of distrust there, and I think the distrust is coming from. I think a lot of it is it, it, you know, it's created on both sides, but I think both sides need to recognise where their strengths and weaknesses are. And on the charity side, I think there's a there's a lot uh, there's a big journey. I think that. that the, the charity world, um, you know, hopefully is, is, is getting on them to, to, uh, to Juliet's uh, comments about the, the Beacon Collaborative and, and, and the work they're doing and the research they're publishing, and, um, uh, which is um, and, and a new program actually they're launching now with the Institute of Fundraising, to, um, uh, which Barclays are supporting, which I think is, is really interesting and it's going to this issue about, you know, what is the uh, what is the what are the demographics in terms of what how do how do different people view their grant making? So it, it's looking at it's looked at sort of uh, different groups in terms of attitudes towards giving, and trying to translate all that into language and into concepts that that, uh, that the fundraisers can understand. So that when they have those conversations with their donors, um, you know, to your point, Jake, about the. Uh, the, the, the dissatisfaction that there's, there's a better sort of mutual understanding. Um, so I think that the, there's a great opportunity to improve that dialogue, and I think if that um, I think there's just as much work, if not more work, to be done there than there is actually around you know around organisations you know like do this in her area or or indeed Anthony you know the wealth management. I think we've got to get better dialogue between the charity sector and, and donors. Can I just pick up on this point about conflict and nepotism and, 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 and you were mentioning one of the benefits of working with your advisors that they can help to network and potentially bring others in on philanthropic projects, I took that as implied. Is there a danger that those others they're bringing in are getting a worse service because you're the client they want to keep happy and therefore they are recommending people to do the thing you want to do? Um, because I think that that's another danger that we're talking about. And is there a danger that UBS wants to say our foundation is giving away 100 million or a million or whatever it is, and so we'd rather actually one of our clients gave their money to us than did what a good impartial advisor would do? Um, so, uh, I mean, it's a good question. Um, I suppose it comes back to my comments around we, we try to take a view that we want to do what is most impactful. And if, 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 if a client wants to build an orphanage and they want to to do it, and they'll give us 10 million to do it, and that'll help us reach our, target, reach our target, we would say no, we think that it's harmful to children. There are better outcomes that you can have with that 10 million. Would you like to go on an impact journey to get there? We'd love to work with you to do that. Um, as opposed to saying, yes, we will fund orphanage programs. Um, take your 10 million to help us reach our target. I think you have to act in the former way, otherwise you're not giving good advice. No, my only thoughts is that I think uh, somebody made a comment earlier on about education. I think you know there's a huge opportunity, every advisor, you know, to to help us, uh, help donors, help uh, those who've got philanthropies of, uh, around educating us. I think. Um, you know, we can learn a huge amount through the experience you've got. So I, I, I would say, you know, we're there with our open arms, you know, to, to, to learn. We're sponges. We want to, we want to know. We want to challenge ourselves. So, you know, keep, keep the education coming. Uh, do you have anything you want to come in on particularly? Or any final thoughts for the panel as we start to wrap up? Very good.
Yeah. Um, I think the, uh, I just wanted to touch on the point about investor activism because I think it's really interesting. I sit on the board of a 150 million pound foundation and we were talking about whether or not we could influence change through being shareholders in a business um, and or whether we should divest and invest alongside our morals. And, and the moral maze we went through left us with the conclusion that it is if we are investors who are engaging in order to improve the business, we cannot also profit from that engagement. And therefore, any money that we make from holding the oil company that we're trying to transition into a solar company, we shouldn't cope to pay our salaries or to run our grants pot, and that should be given to a separate charity. And that means that for our financial advisors, that money can't uh, uh, count towards the return targets that we're looking for. I think that that's the only way to square the moral circle that doesn't leave us with um, the excuse for signing a letter once a year saying we're engaging well, we're making as much money as possible um, out of the next one. Um, so we're about to wrap up. Thank you so much, Ross Charles, for having us, uh, for the really impact, for putting it on. John's going to say something. I'm going to answer your question very quickly before, before um, John does um, about the role of professional advisors. And, and I, I, I think that we can't overstate the importance of this sector um, and lawyers, accountants, banks will, will have a huge role for better or worse on the future of the planet, the, the shape of our society and I think that they should absolutely be engaging on these issues um, but if they're going to engage by hiring someone to do philanthropy whilst business as usual continues uh, then they shouldn't bother um, and I think unless they are um, going to be able to do things with proper investment and expertise, then they should be signposting rather than advising because they're not qualified to, to do it. Um, and I hope that uh, the prediction about the direction of, of, um, of the sector is, is right and everything's going to keep getting better with regulation and uh, clients doing more to, to push things along. Um, but um, 